Welcome back to DAISY 2020. For our next session, we're going to discuss about Steele syndrome session. Let me introduce you our chair, Dr. Gan Zong Dan from Taiwan. And as for our commentators, Dr. Yan Xu Ting from Taiwan, Dr. Chen Wei Hua from Taiwan, Dr. Masaaki Murakami from Japan, and Dr. Vikram Vijayang Sanasi from Singapore. Um, hello, everyone. Welcome back uh, to our next section. Uh, I'm Dr. Jimmy Chen uh, from Taiwan. Uh, last uh, yesterday, I uh, wasn't be able to be here. It took me a while to be here. Yeah, now I successfully I'm here. So uh, it's an honor to uh, uh, to be uh, the uh, pan a panelist in this section. Uh, and the chair of our this section is uh, uh, Professor uh, Gan Zhong Dan. He's uh, currently the chair of the Taiwan Society of Vascular Surgery. So uh, our chair, uh, Professor Khan, could you say something to us? Hi. Hello. Uh, yes, can you we, hear me? Yeah, we, we can hear you. OK, thanks, everybody. Come back to the, this section. I'm Dr. Khan from Tainan, Taiwan. And I'm, I'm uh, pleased to, uh, I'm honored to be here to chair this section. And uh, I think the topic in here is very important uh, to, to deal with the uh, ABSS uh, patients. Uh, we deal the uh, steel syndrome uh, very importantly. Uh, uh, the good news is uh, we have the four very experienced uh, commentators uh, in here, Dr. Yan, Dr. Tang, uh, Dr. Masaki, and uh, Vikaran. And uh, I think the time is important, so let's welcome to the, the our four speakers. The first one maybe uh, is uh, Shu Song uh, Song Hao Su. His topic will tell us the how to uh, uh, how to discuss. He will discuss the steel syndrome for the pathological cause and the how to do how to prevention the the steel syndrome. I think this is very important issue. Uh, I think if uh, Dr. Shu is uh, here. I think Dr. Shu is ready. Okay. Yeah. Uh, let's, so let's yeah. welcome Dr. him. Dr. Shu, please. Uh, Dr. Shu, please. Next, let's welcome Dr. Su Shanghao from Taiwan. His topic is understanding steel syndrome causes and prevention. Hi, dear colleague and uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's a uh, very uh, happy to be here, and it's uh, my honor to be invited to talk this uh, kind of uh, very old and but uh, very important uh, disease. So at first I have to have to tell everybody that I'm not uh, the, the, uh, the, the Dr. Call, the chairman, Dr. Call, Paul, Kirk Borden is not uh, my boss. It's just only the same name of, uh, my, of my hospital. Although I know he's uh, rich enough to build a hospital. <laughs> it's not a joke. <laughs> So introduction is, uh, uh, in the U.S. Uh, uh, paper, I will, we will find that only uh, have a 6% uh, uremic patient. Mm, but uh, in Taiwan, I, I, don't, I don't really know about the real uh, prevalence. So uh, that's, uh, I, I use the, the, the overseas uh, data. And the second thing I to have to say is that the steel syndrome is uh, variable symptoms because uh, everyone, when you uh, go to the surgeon, every patient go to the surgeon, the, the symptom may be uh, from a minor syndrome to a very severe syndrome. So uh, it depends. And uh, the third thing I think is the very important is the prevention is uh, better than cure. So we will see the most of uh, the, the paper here just to treat the complication of uh, the steel syndrome. Right now here, I'm just uh, to uh, share my uh, personal experience about the, to prevent the steel syndrome at first. This is the, the classification of the steel syndrome. I think it's, uh, it's almost the same as uh, the uh, pre peripheral artery disease. At a stage, the you will see the retrograde dialysis flow without complaint. It's only a steel phenomenon. 
and uh, stage one, two, three, four. Uh, everyone can just uh, to see what I'm provide here. I don't want to uh, to the waste time to explain the stage. This one is very uh, uh, mild symptom patient. I uh, used to describe this patient has the the fingernail is like uh, any ring of the treat. You will see the 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 thumb, the index finger, the middle finger, with the uh, the traffic change. What you can see uh, right now, maybe when I take this picture, is a uh, is at uh, the end of the winter. So the the you will see the nail bed near the near the button of the nail bed. The the nail is a uh, growth is good. The second, the second patient has the ischemic pain, but still can tolerate. But uh, the symptom signs uh, uh, got more severe during the hemodialysis. The third patient has, uh, you will see the, the little finger with uh, a dry gangrene, dry gangrene. This one uh, is, uh, uh, I think the, he didn't feel any pain. He didn't feel pain. I, I, he uh, uh, go to my clinic, just a uh, foul smell. But and, uh, the nurse to suggest him to see me is a very uh, very uh, uh, severe the uh, steel syndrome. So the second I want to talk about the pathophysiology of the steel syndrome. Right now, when we are construct a future, we will see three things. Uh, balance to, uh, to have the concern about the, the steel syndrome. The first is uh, the proximal artery the pressure. The second is uh, distal artery pressure. Then the third is the venous uh, compliance. When this, these three things imbalance, it, it causes the steel syndrome. So I, we will see that the three things uh, is provided the, the, the the last slide, the risk factor C is the uh, decreased the proximal artery like the subclavian artery or um, brachial artery stenosis that uh, causes the steel syndrome. And the other is the increased the distal artery pressure. I think most of the steel syndrome uh, comes from the, this uh, risk factor. It's uh, like old age, atherosclerosis, DM, female gender, heavy smoker. The third is increased the venous uh, flow. And the, the, you can see the paper say that the break artery for feeding artery or large diameter AB fistula anastomosis or large vein size will cause this kind of venous flow. But uh, I think this uh, problem will cause two directions. The first direction uh, is uh, to uh, the uh, steel syndrome. The other, I think, is to the high cardiac upper failure. Most I have the patient I see, most of them are... Uh, uh, high cardiac up failure. Besides, uh, if the patient has previous arterial steel cases, if you do another AV feature anastomosis, I think the risk for arterial steel syndrome is, uh, is uh, still the very, uh, uh, very to concern about that. So let's uh, talk about the last uh, uh, portion of my uh, presentation is the prevention uh, strategy. I think Two things I have to keep in mind. It's first, the early detection is very important. And uh, in my opinion, I'm a surgeon. I think manage management of any complication is always too late. You will see the paper that see you are so many uh, complicated sur uh, surgery like a DIR or RUDI, any kind of uh, any kind of uh, the. I see that it's a very beautiful, very uh, mm, suffocate, it's a complicated the, the, the search, surgical skill. I don't think this is a good way for, for our strategy. Our strategy is to find a way to prevent it before it happens. So the preoperative the strategy, we will see the three things uh, as the, the slide before that uh, you have to throw the vascular examination to find any kind of uh, uh, stenosis of actually stenosis of patient or any uh, risk factor like DM like uh, uh, female gender. Uh, the the simple way is uh, 
It's an Allen test for the patient. If you are to, to have do the every future for the feeding artery that with a very uh, poor Allen test result, I think the steel syndrome is uh, higher. And the third is uh, you can do uh, ultrasound or duplicate scan if needed. Uh, that's why I, uh, that you can uh, choose the right, right way, right uh, site for, for the right AV fissure. And the operative strategy, my experience and some uh, the papers said is that at first they try the distal artery at first. Uh, do not try to do a break artery uh, or extra, even axillary artery as the feeding artery at first. And the textbooks always say that uh, the artery autonomy uh, to uh, uh, not more than uh, six millimeter. And uh, the third is uh, artery to vein graph. The, the artery stenosis, the, the anastomosis is uh, not more than 75% for inferior artery diameter. And uh, this, uh, this, uh, this kind of problem, we can show you some uh, uh, method. And uh, in my opinion, I think you can do the Dupla scan right after the anastomosis to see if any uh, uh, diminished flow of the distal artery. And the, the last thing, I think, revision if needed. At the first, it's, uh, it's very important as soon as possible. I will show you some, uh, uh, especially for the, when you use the PDF graph for the patient uh, with uh, uh, artery steel syndrome right after the anastomosis, I, I have uh, some uh, uh, video to share here. This is the, uh, use your imagination, this is the, the microsurgery. The plastic surgeon, when they for do the, the anastomosis, you will see the, the right side is the, the artery size, the left side is the vein size. When you, when you uh, uh, have the problem of the small artery autonomy and the very bigger uh, vein size, I uh, suggest that you should use the interrupted a horizontal meshes to to not to prevent to prevent to enlarge the artery autonomy to then the steel syndrome will uh, will decrease this is the use your uh, imagination that uh, i uh, just uh, use this uh, video to share my experience when you just uh, do the the pdfe to actually the and Moses, and right after that, uh, you will find that the distal pass is uh, is uh, ab is uh, diminished or even absent. You can use this kind of uh, uh, longitudinal application. Use a bus cram to to uh, partial cram the PDFE graphs, and uh, you will use the horizontal. Then you will do the just a one stage the, to diminish, to decrease the, the size. Then if uh, the problem did not uh, resolve, then we uh, do the interrupt, interrupt the, the anastomosis uh, as uh, when we uh, detect the distal artery size and the uh, mm, distal artery, the passation to meet the the need you can you can uh, let the AV fissure maturation and uh, to prevent the steel syndrome in the, in the future then the post operative follow up i think in taiwan i think it depends on the real clinic situation because in taiwan some most of patient we see one times in my life, in your life, because if when you do a good job, then the patient can uh, can use the, this uh, good fissure, and if he will, they will never meet you again. And you do the bad job, the patient will not meet only uh, also did not meet you again uh, because uh, he uh, find another surgeon, maybe to Doctor Ko or Doctor Chen, not to <laughs> meet me uh, in the future. So, so I. I here I will to uh, make a final uh, conclusion that uh, 
treat steel syndrome as soon as possible. Prevention is always better than cure. That's my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Dr. Su, for a uh, very informative talk. Yeah, I think uh, I think that um, he, uh, Dr. Su, gave us a very good point that actually the steel syndrome is really very difficult to treat. So uh, prevention is always uh, better than cure. And he, he did give us several uh, techniques that uh, to uh, minimize the uh, size of the inflow in order to uh, manage the problem. Uh, because of the time, so I think we uh, proceed to the next talk. The next talk should be provided by uh, Dr. Yu Zhenya from China. Uh, today, his talk will be uh, in the will be in the record mode. Uh, record mode. So I think we can uh, go to the next talk. Let's welcome Dr. Yu Zhenya from China. His topic is Steel Syndrome: Strategies to Preserve Both the Vascular Access and the Extremity. Thanks, Darcy, for inviting me to present in this topic. I come from the Department of Vascular Surgery, Beijing Tongren Hospital, Capital Medical University. I have no financial disclosure. The construction of an AVF results in a decrease in the ipsilateral digit pressure in approximately 80% of patients. However, this psychological steel is usually well tolerated. About 4 to 5 percent of patients has a DAS after creation of AV access, especially in brachial artery based fistula. Risk factors for development of steel are age more than 60 years, female gender, tobacco use, diabetics, peripheral vascular disease, coronary artery disease, hypertension, especially in patients with previous radio artery harvest, multiple previous accesses low limb exercise, previous DAS, and proximal fistula. There are three distinct etiology of DAS. First, a large AV anastomosis producing a high fistula flow with distal ischemic symptoms caused to steel. Secondly, an arterial stenosis induced low arterial inflow. Thirdly, the lack of vascular adaption or collateral flow to the forearm will prevent compensation for the flow going into the fistula. The left picture shows basic components of an arterial venous fistula. Flow in the artery just distal to the fistula may be anti-green, retrograde, or bidirectional. The flow through the artery distal to the fistula can be compared with the current flow through the cross arm of a western circuit bridge and is a function of the resistance ratio of the proximal artery, fistula, collateral circulation, and periphery. The pressure gradients that grow in the direction and magnitude of the blood flow in the artery distal to the fistula. Dust can generally be diagnosed based on signs and symptoms. Physical examination of the hand will reveal some combination of cold skin, pila, cyanosis, diminished sensation, ulceration, and gangrene. The radio and ulnar pulse are usually diminished. Surgical treatment of dust is based on the severity of clinical symptoms. Patients with moderate to severe dust have symptoms such as rest pain, motor dysfunction, or ulceration require treatment. Confirmatory testing can be performed by digital PPG with the fistula open and after manual compression of the fistula. A BDP less than 60 mm mercury or a DBI less than 0.4 in the symptomatic patients supports the diagnosis of death. Both have reliable sensitivity and specificity. A return of BDP back towards normal with compression of the axis indicates reversibility of the condition. The rationale in management of steel is to relieve symptoms, avoid the progression or limb loss, improve quality of life, and maintain access flow. The inflow problem should be solved by PTA or bypass. The simplest and reliable method is ligation of the axis. However, it leaves the patients with no access, so it should be restricted only as a measure to save an extremity in an acutely and critical sick patients. Other surgical management of death, including bending, 
distal revascularization with interval ligation, proximalization of arterial inflow, revision used distal inflow, and distal radial artery ligation. Flow restriction is the most common procedure technique to increase the resistance that is offered the circuit, including narrowing down anastomosis, bending, and Miller technique. Case 1 is a 61-year-old female with right-hand cold, numbness, and tolerable pain. She had a stage 1 brachial basilic transposition 8 weeks ago. The physical examination revealed right-hand pale and cold. The pulse of the radial artery was not palpable. The thrill of the fistula was strong. Duplex showed the diameter of the anastomosis is 0.9 cm. The volume flow of brachial artery is 1500 ml per minute. Her hand BDP is 33 mmHg without fistula compression and 161 mmHg with fistula compression. BBI is 0 0.19. During the stage 2 operation, the anastomosis was established 60 cm approximately and narrowing down to 0 0.5 cm. After the operation, all ischemic symptoms released. Her radial pulse can be palpable and digit pressure increased to 95 millimeter mercury. The volume flow of brachial artery decreased from 1500 to 770 milliliter per minute. The drill procedure, first performed by Zanzer in 1988, is based on constructing a bypass from the artery proximal to the AV axis to an artery distal to the axis. Reduce the ratio of resistance between the peripheral circulation and the AV axis, and directs a greater proportion of blood towards the periphery. To prevent arterial retrograde flow, the access artery is ligated just distal to the AV axis. The bypass graft function as a low resistance bypass in parallel configuration to the collateral network. This serves to reduce the total resistance of the peripheral circulation and the total circuit. Since 2006, a new approach, proximalization of the arterial inflow, as described by Zano, has appeared to be very successful in the treatment of death. The PI procedure does not require the ligation of a healthy artery. With the PI technique, the arterial inflow originated from the proximal brachial, the axillary, or even from the subscribing artery via anastomosis with PTFE graft. The modification of the PI technique was first described in 2014. In this procedure, the grafts are replaced with a basilic wing. This new operation does not require prosthetic graft and showed similar results to the original PI procedure. According hagen pursuri equation, Due to the larger arterial diameter and the shorter distance to the aorta, the resistance in proximal artery is lower than in more peripheral arteries. Therefore, the pressure drop in the distal artery of a proximal AV anastomosis is much less than with a distal AV anastomosis. The second case is a 68-year-old female with ESRD secondary to diabetics and hypertension present to the hospital with left hand rest pain and ulceration on the top of the third digit for one month. A Chris fistula was performed in left cubital three years ago. Physical examination revealed her left hand code and has an ulcer on the third digit. The radial and ulnar artery paths were not palpable. Transaxillary artery angiogram revealed the contrast go directly into the cephalic and basalic vein. No blood flow was noticed in the arteries distal to the anastomosis. After fistula compression, DSA reviews the anti-grid blood flow in the ulnar artery and the interosseous artery. The radial artery was occlusion. The BDP in left hand is 26 mm mercury. After the anastomosis was compressed, it increased to 102 mm mercury. During the operation, a new arterial venous anastomosis was created between the proximal basilic vein and the brachial artery. The venous valve along the basilic vein was destroyed with a wavelotomy. 
The former arterial venous anastomosis between the perforating vein and the cubital artery below the elbow was ligated. The rest pain of the left hand has gone in the next day of operation. The BDP increased from 26 to 62 millimeter mercury. BBI increased from 0 0.16 to 0 0.41. The gangrene ulcer healed one month after operation. Angiogram shows anti-grade blood flow into the patency ulnar and interosseous artery. At three years follow-up, the access keeps a very good condition. Revision using distal inflow is using a smaller distal artery as inflow to lengthen the fistula and preserve anti-grade flow in at least one of the forearm arteries. The key techniques of Rudy including ligation of previous fistula at its origin Re-establishment of the fistula will bypass from a more distal artery source. Autonomous wing is preferred as a conduit of choice. Sometimes we also use transposition of the radial artery as inflow conduit. The palm arch patency is premised. The trial first described in 1971 allows correction of hand ischemia in distal AVF with flow 300 to 600 milliliter per minute. It consists of surgical ligation or endovascular embolization of the radial artery distal to the anastomosis. Its aim is to interrupt the reverse flow from the distal radial artery and to increase hand blood flow. This case is a 41-year-old female with type 1 diabetics for 20 years and a CKD stage 5. Her head left radial cephalic fistula for 5 years and complained rest pain and ulcer of the left hand for 1 month. Examination of the patients revealed two ulcers on the second and the fifth digit. DSA showed a slender, continuous ulnar artery and retrograde flow in the juxtanastomosis distal radial artery. The BDP is 38 million mercury and increased to 100 or 63 when compression of anastomosis or distal radial artery separately. The radial artery distal to anastomosis was ligated and the digital pressure increased from 38 to 72 millimeter mercury. The ulcer healed in three months. Conclusion Does in grade 2b to 4a need intervention? depends on survival of tissue and hemodynamic study. The poor access survival or major tissue loss should be considered ligation. If the access is high flow, you can select binding or rudy. For normal or low flow access, geo or pi should be preferred to choice. Dryo is suitable for radial steel in distal access. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you. I think we have heard very um, interesting uh, talk from Dr. Yu, and I think the algorithm is uh, very helpful to treat this um, uh, still syndrome with the um, revision or with bending, uh, all sort of technique that we just learned from Dr. Yu. Uh, I think because of time, we uh, put the discussion in, in after all the four speakers has uh, done the talk, so. I think next speaker, I invite Dr. Haraguchi from Japan for your talk on this surgical correction of the dialysis access to syndrome. Uh, Dr. Haraguchi? Let's welcome Dr. Haru ha Hiroaki Haraguchi from Japan. His topic is surgical correction of dialysis access steel syndrome. Oh, the steel syndrome. I'm uh, Hiroaki Haraguchi from the Haraguchi Vascular Access Clinic. So the first, the level of severity of steel syndrome, the stage one reduced DPI with coldness and pain, paleness of the fingers. Stage two, pain during dialysis system. Stage three, pain at rest. Stage four, isolation and necrosis of the skin. Uh, Fontaine classification can be used to evaluate the severity of the ischemic symptoms of steel syndrome and the method of treatment should be determined 
by the level of several steers. On the diagnosis of steer syndrome, first, digital brachial posture index DBI, second, at the sonography, third, laser Doppler fluorometry, fourth, angio angiography, fifth, prothesmography, sixth, thermography. So among these, it has been reported that DBI of less than 0 0.6 following VA construction had the sens sensitivity of 100% specificity of 76% as it had shown to be effective in the diagnosis of steel syndrome. This is the strategy of steel syndrome. First, we, we should uh, see the ischemic monomeric neuropathy. The onset ischemic monomeric neuropathy, IMH, within 24 hours of the access construction is indicated for emergency surgical access closure due to the possibility that conduction will be irreversible. When ischemic symptoms advance, such as significant coldness of numbness, follow up with So that this is a therapeutic uh, strategy for the IMN. Escape monomeric neuropathy is positive emergent access closure. Ischemic monomeric neuropathy, negative surgical binding drug therapy. The treatment policy based on severity, severity. Uh, stage 1, stage 2, the observation or drug therapy. If the symptom worsen, the stage 3, stage 4, uh, the object evaluation, access pressure, ultrasound, angiography, etc. So if the distal artery stenosis uh, is positive, the PTA of the artery. So the if so this is a treatment policy for excess blood flow. If the excess blood flow is positive, we should um, do the surgical binding. If the excessive blood flow negative. If the distal AV fistula, distal artery ligation, and AVF in the elbow or graft in elbow or upper arm, and we uh, do, do the drill. So if symptom does not improve, uh, this is a venous binding. Here, the anosmosis, we use the EPTF graft for binding. Uh, this is a drill. So this is a graft from the uh, brachial artery to the, uh, to the vein here. So the, this is a drill, drill is the ligation of the distal side of the graft of the artery and then using the vein graft from here the artery to artery the bypass so the some uh, artery flow go to the, the side So this is a uh, revision we use in this uh, art for Rudy. And uh, well, this is a Rudy too, not use a graft. 
So the, this is uh, the slide of the Eighth International Congress on Vascular Access. It's a book fellow. Uh, the slide the here, the uh, closer to the radio artery, then um, to this anastomosis to the vein here. So the Rudy to radial artery transposition, 47 patient, um, 19 brachial cephalic, 28 brachial basic AV fistula, non PTFE, mean age of AVF, 25 years. This is the uh, brachial artery fluid pre and post operation. Here the pre, um, pre brachial artery flow, approximately. Um, 1700 and then uh, the artery flow after the operation is under 800. So the patency is here is approximately good uh, patency for the patient. In our colic and venous and artery binding for excessive flow this is the venous binding here, and pre binding is after venous binding. Here, the, this is the outer sound of the venous binding. This is the binding here. So, the, this is the artery binding. It is a um, radial artery here, the binding. So, the um, uh, brachial arterial flow before and after binding. Uh, this is 100% uh, before, then the all, all cases uh, arterial flow is decreased uh, within two years. Then the, it's a venous binding. Uh, almost all cases, the brachial artery decreased after uh, binding within uh, two years. This is a venous binding, the outer binding. Uh, almost two, uh, both of the two binding, the uh, uh, post-operative arterial flow is under 80 percent and at, at the binding is upper mixture three and uh, sixty percent um, compared to the pre binding. The conclusion Steel syndrome is a peripheral psychology disorder that developed due to the construction of the VA. It is recommended that the condition and the case of case codes be examined. Second it is recommended that the proper di diagnosis and evaluation be performed for steel syndrome. Determining the severity of steel syndrome is important, and for fortune, Fontaine classification can be used for determining the severity. Improvement in blood flow of the restricted axis, outer sonography, angular fee, and distal brachial pressure index can be useful in the objective evaluation of steel syndrome. It is recommended that the treatment method for steel syndrome can be based upon its condition and Okay, uh, thank you very much for the Dr. Harukuchi's uh, talk on the steel syndrome. I think everyone must have a lot of questions about how to do a good bending. So I will leave the question uh, later. So our next speaker is a doctor uh, from Thailand, Dr. Vira Suwan Rajisri. And I think he's, uh, he's going to talk about endovascular correction of dialysis access to syndrome. Uh, let's welcome Dr. Vira. Let's welcome our next speaker, Dr. Vira Suwan Duang Sari from Thailand. His topic is endovascular correction of dialysis as a steel syndrome. 
Good afternoon, Chairman, Lady and Gentlemen. I would like to talk about endovascular collection of dialysis excess steel syndrome. Dialysis excess steel syndrome was first described in 1969, and the incident allowed 1 to 2 percent for risk AV fistula, and between 4 to 8 percent with brachial bed excess. And the risk factor were diabetes. PAD, CAD, brachial bed access, female gender, history of dialysis access steel syndrome, and multiple previous access procedure. Indication of treatment were grade 2 intermittent ischemia during dialysis and grade 3 ischemic less pain or tissue loss. There were two basic suggestions for the treatment of dialysis access steel syndrome. The first strategy was Excess flow reduction. We have three options bending procedure, revision using distal inflow or Ludi procedure, and location of the excess was the last option. And another strategy was augmentation of distal arterial flow. We have three options proximalization of arterial inflow, distal revascularization into a ligation or due procedure, and the last option was distal radial artery ligation. For endovascular treatment option, before perform PTA, we should perform angiography, include imaging from aortic art to the hand, and we can perform inflow angiopathy if we can see inflow stenosis, or outflow angiopathy, what the most common procedure if we can see outflow stenosis or occlusion, or sometimes we can perform inflow and outflow angioplasty. And the last option was coil embolization of radial artery. And then I would like to show you for our case. 55-year-old female present with CKD and risk vector were diabetes and hypertension. We performed left brachiocephalic AV fistula one year ago. And clinical presentation were less pain and tissue loss. This slide. You can see angiography. We advance the Y and the G through basilic vein to anatomosis and perform angiography. And you can see severe stenosis and occlusion of ulna artery and minimal blood flow to the finger. And after we perform PTA with 2.5 mm balloon, you can see the complication was perforation. And the final result show good flow to radial and ulna artery and good flow to the palmar arch in improved blood flow to the finger. After we perform PTA of left forearm at two weeks for up, the clinical improved no arm pain. Another case, 63 year old male present with CKD and risk factor were diabetes, hypertension and CAD. We performed light transport basilic AV fistula 10 months ago and clinical presentation was less pain. In geography, you can see stenosis of radial and ulnar artery. We advance the Y and the micro catheter into radial artery and perform PTA with 2.5 mm balloon. And the result is okay, good flow to radial artery. But you can see the palma art is not complete. And then we advance the Y and micro catheter into Alna artery, and you can see the light picture good outflow. And in geography, you can see good flow to radial and alna artery. But for the light picture, you can see dissection and recoil of distal alna artery. And the final result good flow to radial and alna artery. The light picture show you can see we. For this case, we try to advance the Y to make the palma loop, but we cannot succeed. And the final result is not perfect. At seven months follow up, clinical improve, no arm pain. And the last here that I want I would like to show you 78 year old female present with CKD and risk factor was hypertension. We performed light brachiocephalic AV fistula one year ago and performed PTA of light forearm because of still six months ago. 
and clinical presentation was less pain and tissue loss. And we decided to perform surgical correction. We performed proximalization of arterial inflow, but the clinical is not improved. And we decided to perform PTA again. And geography, you can see good flow to radial artery, but for ulna artery, you can see recoil and reocclusion. And then we as one the why and use a scalding balloon, angio scalp balloon, 2.5 millimeter to perform angioplasty. And you, and we try to add one the why to make the palmar loop, but we cannot succeed. You can see perforation. And then I as one, and we add one the why to radial artery to make the loop to perform palmar loop angioplasty. And the final result, you can see good flow to lady and ulna artery, good flow to the palmar loop, and improved blood flow to the finger. After we perform repeated PTA of light forearm with scalding balloon, unfortunately for this case, the clinical not improved, and we decide to perform AV Vistola ligation. And after ligation, the clinical improved no arm pain, improved wound healing. For our small experience in two years, we perform endovascular collection for dialysis excess steel syndrome in five patients, and risk vector were diabetes and hypertension. On five patients, we perform brachial artery bed AV fistula, and the result of endovascular treatment, clinical improvement in four patients, and not improved in one patient, and we have to perform AV fistula ligation because of no clinical improvement after PTA and PAI procedure. And this slide shows the reported of small case of six patients in five years with mean age 62 years and risk factor were diabetes, embolization of distal radial artery and angioplasty of proximal artery stenosis were performed in all six patients and symptomatic recovery was observed in all patients. And look at this slide, the left picture, you can see minimal blood flow to the finger before embolization of distal radial artery compared with the right picture. After embolization of radial artery, you can see improved blood flow to the finger. And this slide show the conclusion of our clinical practice when the patient present with dialysis excess steel syndrome, we perform complete angiography. If no inflow or outflow stenosis, we choose surgical collection. If not improved, ligation was the last option. And if presentation of inflow or outflow stenosis, we choose PTA procedure. If not improved, we try again with surgical collection. If not improved, ligation was the last option. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you, Dr. Vera, for this uh, endovas another way, endovascular way to try to treat this problem. Uh, before I pass the uh, microphone to uh, our chair today, uh, there are two questions from our YouTube viewer. Uh, first question is to uh, Dr. Yu. The question is that um, for this uh, uh, more proximal uh, part or more uh, this uh, cubital part inflow, how we choose between Pi and Rudy? Uh, this is the first question for Dr. Yu. Another question is uh, for uh, Dr. Haraguchi, is that about how you choose the size of the graft to do the bending, and the, how, what's the lens you usually pick for bending? So could, uh, could, both, uh, pan, uh, could both speaker answer the question? Okay, uh, for me, it's uh, the patient has a has a good forearm uh, artery. Uh, I will choose the uh, the proximal of the anastomosis. Uh, but if the patient uh, has a poor uh, forearm uh, artery, I prefer uh, use the, the pie technique to to treat the the the, the, the steel syndrome. This is my my my, my choice. Okay. Yeah, and how about the second question, uh, Dr. Haraguchi? How you pick the size of the graft for bending and the length of the graft you pick for bending? 
So the I usually use uh, about uh, five meter, five millimeter of the graph, PTFP graph for bonding, but it depends on the size of the uh, vein. If the vein is very big, I sometimes use eight millimeter of the graft and uh, cut the graft about uh, seven, six to seven millimeters, the bonding. The uh, during bonding, I check the breaker at the floor, so that check the breaker at the floor. If the, um, the arterial flow is about than the 2,000, then I um, suture and um, bonding, and the, the, the breaker, if the breaker artery is about 1,000, I stop to the uh, suture. So the I uh, uh, approximately the about the half of the uh, brachial artery is I stop back. back. Okay. Uh, can, uh, could uh, the chair, Dr. Khan, could you uh, host the uh, the section? Thank you. Uh Thank you, uh, Jimmy Tan, uh, for helping me to, to chair this, uh, to do the job. And uh, uh, to Dr. Yan here, any question, any any comment from Dr. Yan or our other commander, Masaki or Mikaron? Yeah, Mas Masaki. Uh -huh. Okay, uh, thank you for a good presentation. I have one question for the Dr. Haruguchi. Uh, you talked about two bonding techniques. How do you select arterial and venous bonding appropriately? As you mentioned, arterial bonding is better than venous bonding. Uh, Dr. Haruguchi, do you uh, know the question? The question is that I, we saw from your uh, uh, talk that the uh, arterial bending works better than venous bending. So how do you choose between? Yes, I, I and for the steel syndrome, I usually uh, choose the venous bending because sometimes the arterial bending, if I do the arterial bending, the arterial flow is reduced uh, in the, the finger. So that uh, I use the uh, almost only the venous bonding, but, but uh, sometimes the uh, uh, excessive flow itself is a problem, not the steel syndrome, I choose the uh, arterial bonding. So the arterial bonding is easier because the arterial size uh, is uh, uh, almost, almost uh, uh, you know, not not the bigger big big and smaller and it is easier to uh, reduce the flow so the uh, the I think that when the um, uh, for the patient of the excessive flow only not still syndrome I choose the arterial bonding so the for the patient of the still syndrome I choose uh, I select the Venus body. Okay. Uh, uh, Dr. Chen, Chen Sweeney, please. Am I on? Yes, you are online. Yes. Um, I think it's very important to make a difference between giant fistula where there's too much flow going down the vessel where you've got an enlarged brachial artery and you've got many liters of flow going down to the arm, often two, three, four liters. That is not a steel problem. That is a giant fistula problem, which is a burden to the heart. Very different is a steel problem where there's insufficient blood going down to the upper limb, usually because you've got a calcified small brachial artery that won't expand. And that's a steel problem. They're two quite separate problems and they have to be dealt with differently. However, both can be adequately treated by swing vein banding. And that's our standard treatment. 
So in steel syndrome, we measure the flow. If the flow is over one liter, then we band the fistula to send more blood down to the hand and less blood down to the fistula. If it's a low flow state, a steel syndrome with flow in the fistula of only 500 mils, I don't think there's enough blood to supply both the fistula and the hand, and I think you've got to ligate that fistula or use one of the other techniques. The banding technique, we've used two different techniques. One is to place a small balloon, uh, angioplasty balloon, within the swing vein segment, usually a three or four millimeter balloon, and then band around the fistula down onto that balloon. And when you deflate the balloon, you get left with a three or four millimeter channel. That's the standard technique we've used, but it's actually not easy and not straightforward. A technique that we, we switched to that's probably easier to do is to get a piece of three millimeter or four millimeter graft, a very short bit, only five millimeters long or one centimeter long, and put that as an interposition graft in the swing vein. So you dissect out the swing vein, you transect it, and you insert a short piece of three or four millimeter synthetic graft. And that's technically much easier to do, and you very reliably get a three or four millimeter banding that way. Okay, thanks, uh, Jens. Uh, nice talk up. I think that's a uh, two uh, big issue in here. Uh, the steel syndrome is uh, from overflow or just uh, from the peripheral artery disease uh, occluded. So I think it's two different uh, strategy for management. It. And uh, Jimmy. Jimmy Tan, yes. do you have any comments? Uh, yeah, uh, actually I have a question for an audience. So I think I uh, share some question for the panelists to answer. Uh, one question I think Dr. Sweden just mentioned that about how to do the bending, you use a four millimeter balloon. So uh, there's a question here asking about how to determine the bending size uh, using the on table flow or do we have any other guy? I think uh, I can. we can open this question to uh, uh, the panelists. So, uh, any other way that we use to do the bending besides the, um, uh, like Dr. Swing and four minute balloon or flow, may, maybe? Uh, Dr. Haraguchi, you, you use uh, on table echo to do the measurement. Uh, because I, I, I personally also do bending, but uh, we have problem that uh, usually I bend until the flow less than 300. But actually, during the first week of follow up, the blood flow returned to 1,000. So it's not at the same as the flow I saw right immediately right after the operation. So do you have comment on this phenomenon? Yes. Um, the, um, during the operation, the, um, the artery sometimes has a spasm. So the, um, the immediately after branding, the flow is very uh, about... Uh, 800, then uh, after operation, the flow is at uh, 1,000 and over. So the, it is very difficult to, uh, when, when should I uh, stop the bonding? So if the, if the flow of the, uh, the brachial artery is less than 500, sometimes the uh, access occluded. So the uh, it is very difficult. But uh, when I, I choose the artery, uh, the, uh, um, just almost uh, uh, immediately after bonding and uh, after operation one, there were one week, the brachial artery flow is not so different. So I'm not sure the why, but the... Uh, uh, but the venous bonding, it is very difficult to um, uh, regulate the flow, flow immediately after bonding. So the, uh, uh, it's a, I think it's very difficult, difficult to uh, when, when I stop the band. But. Uh, uh, Chair or Dr. Khan, I think we are uh, uh, almost time for this uh, section. Could you please close the section for us? Yes, thank you uh, for everybody to come uh, in this section, join this session, they have a great talk in here. And thanks everybody.
and uh, I think we we go maybe take a rest and uh, go proceed to next section. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.